Hello, my name is Dr. John Doan, and I will be giving a talk on hepatobiliary liver and spleen. Hepatobiliary studies can be used to evaluate acute cholecystitis, chronic cholecystitis, biliary dyskinetic syndrome, biliary leak, neonatal hepatitis, and biliary atresia. Some basics of hepatobiliary scan. So the bilirubin is transported in the blood bound to albumin. Bilirubins are then extracted by hepatocytes, secreted into the bile cannuliculi, and cleared through the biliary tract into the small bowels. Immunodiacetic acid compounds are taken up and cleared by similar mechanisms, but not conjugated nor metabolized. Some aminodiacetic acid analogs include Hida, Decida, Mebrofenin, or Colatec. Techniques for Hida scan with patient preparation of Patients should fast for four to 12 hours. If patient fasting over 24 hours, he or she may need cholecystokine and pretreatment. Narcotics should be stopped six to 12 hours prior to the study. Patient is positioned in a supine position and image acquired in the anterior projections. So IV injections of five to 10 millicury of technetium 99M IDA, most of the time it's either mebrofenin or Colatec, and imaging acquired for 60 minutes. At the end of the 60 minutes, if the gallbladder is not filled, delayed imaging up to four hours or IV morphine sulfate. If the gallbladder shows up, gallbladder ejection fraction can be obtained to evaluate for biliary dyskinetic syndrome. With gallbladder ejection fraction portion of the exam, we give IV cholecystokinin slowly infused over 10 to 30 minutes and additional imaging acquired for 30 minutes. Then region of interest is placed over the gallbladder and gallbladder ejection fraction calculated. In a normal scan, the radio tracer is passed from the blood pool to the liver. So the liver is well visualized by five minutes. Activity should clear from the heart by five to 10 minutes. Activity is then excreted into the bowel ducts and ducts should be well visualized and the liver is clear of the activity. Gallbladder should be filled with radio tracer in the 60 minutes of dynamic imaging. When tracer is cleared from the liver and goes into the bowel ducts, it then passes, bypasses the gallbladder and enters the duodenum. Approximately two thirds goes to the duodenum and about one third is uh, stored in the gallbladder. So this case of a 49 year old female with right upper quadrant abdominal pain Initial 60 minutes of imaging shows radio trace activity in the liver with progression into the bowel ducts and into the small bowel. Radio tracer is also seen to accumulate within the gallbladder. Next, gallbladder ejection fraction was obtained. And in this case, the gallbladder ejection fraction is 68%. So this is a normal hepatobiliary study, initial imaging with tracer activity in the liver excretions into the common bowel duct and small bowel and accumulates in the gallbladder with normal gallbladder ejection fraction of greater than 35%. HIDA scan is a good study for evaluate to evaluate acute cholecystitis with high sensitivity and specificity. 
most of the time, the acute cholecystitis is caused by cystic duct obstruction, where there's impacted stone in the cystic duct, where tracer cannot enter an inflamed gallbladder. If no gallbladder is visualized after one hour, additional imaging with delayed or post-morphine sulfate imaging acquired. If gallbladder fails to fill after four hours or after morphine sulfate, that's compatible with acute cholecystitis. This is a 43-year-old female with right upper quadrant abdominal pain. So initial 60 minutes of imaging shows radio tracer in the liver with excretion into the common bowel duct and small bowel. However, gallbladder is not seen, radio trace activity is not seen in the gallbladder. Delayed imaging again shows no radio trace activity in the gallbladder. So this is compatible with acute cholecystitis with non-visualization of the gall gallbladder in the initial 60 minutes of imaging nor after four hours of imaging compatible with acute cholecystitis. This is another example of acute cholecystitis. Radio trace activity in the, in the liver, excretion into the common bowel duct, and progress into the small bowel, but no radio trace activity is seen in the gallbladder, even at one hour and two hour, compatible with acute cholecystitis. Now, with this case, pay attention to this rim of activity outlining the gallbladder fossa along the inferior edge of the liver. So this is a rim sign. So with acute cholecystitis with rim sign, 40% of these patients have a perforated or gangrenous gallbladder. So it's important to communicate that finding to the referring physician or surgeon. This is another case of acute cholecystitis where radio tracer activity from the liver has already progressed into the common bowel duct and a lot of it has excreted into the small bowel. Now there is a nubbin of activity in the cystic duct proximal to the site of obstruction. This is a cystic duct sign associated with acute cholecystitis. These are some correlative studies, gallbladder ultrasounds, which showed normal gallbladder, gallbladder with gallstones, and inflamed gallbladder of acute cholecystitis. So brief intro to gallbladder ultrasound, usually fluid is dark or anechoic. Soft tissue, shows some shade of equigenicity. So here, the fluid or the bile in the gallbladder is anechoic, clean, with normal gallbladder wall and no pericholecystic fluid. So this is a normal gallbladder ultrasound. The middle image shows a echogenic stone with posterior acoustic shadowing. So this is a gallstone inside the gallbladder lumen, the gallbladder wall is not significantly thickened and there is no significant pericarcistic fluid. So this is just cholelithiasis without sonographic evidence for acute cholecystitis. The right image shows echogenic stone and debris with posterior acoustic shadowing compatible with probable cholelithiasis with some thickened gallbladder wall and some pericarcistic fluid. So this is compatible with sonographic findings of acute cholecystitis. Chronic cholecystitis or biliary dyskinetic syndrome can be either calculus or acalculus. There are constellation of findings that are characteristics to chronic cholecystitis or biliary dyskinetic syndrome, but not specific. So usually with the initial 60 minutes of dynamic imaging, you would see radio tracer accumulation in the gallbladder. Tracer is seen in the liver progressing into the 
biliary ducts and excreting into the small bowel and radio trace accumulation in the gallbladder on the initial 60 minutes of imaging. But when you use, when you do the gallbladder ejection fraction study with CCK or chronic uh, cholecystokinin, you would get poor gallbladder ejection fraction with a GBEF of less than 35%. This is a 47 year old male with right upper quadrant abdominal pain with normal gallbladder ultrasound. The HIDA scan is done with gallbladder ejection fraction. So as you can see, radio trace activity is seen in the liver parenchyma with excretion into the bile ducts and excreting into the small bowel. Radio tracer is also seen to accumulate in the gallbladder. So initial imaging shows normal physiologic activity. However, with gallbladder ejection fraction, the gallbladder ejection fraction here was done and shows 11% GBEF. So normal gallbladder ejection fraction should be greater than 35%. In this case, the gallbladder ejection fraction is less than 35% and that is abnormal, suggesting biliary dyskinetic syndrome. Usually these patients would get elective cholecystectomy if he or she has significant abdominal symptoms um, that would uh, be helpful with elective cholecystectomy. This is a 38-year-old female with right upper quadrant abdominal pain and recent laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So as you can see, there's intense radio trace activity in the liver parenchyma, but no significant excretion of activity into the biliary ducts and into the small bowel, even up to 60 minutes of imaging. So this is a persistent hepatic or liver scan sign where you see intense trace activity in the liver and no tracer in the common bowel duct or small bowel. So when you see a liver scan sign, be aware that it's likely due to high grade common bowel duct or complete common bowel duct obstruction. The hint in that is that there's a recent laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Additional post-surgical biliary scan commonly done for biliary leaks after cholecystectomy. So there's higher rate of biliary leakage with laparoscopic cholecystectomy. The leakage usually appears as increasing activity in the gallbladder fossa, along the dome of the liver, and along the pericolic gutters. So the technique usually used for this, you inject the patient with the IDA compounds, analogs, patient placed in supine position and dynamic imaging acquired for 60 minutes or until you see the leakage and patient may be repositioned or lateral images and delayed images may be necessary to find the leakage. This is a 38 year old female with right upper quadrant abdominal pain with recent laparoscopic cholecystectomy. As you can see, there is accumulation of radio tracer activity in the gallbladder fossa with activity tracking along the pericolic gutter. So this is compatible with a bowel leak or biliary leak where activity is not in a bowel loop pattern. It tracks along the pericolic gutter and progressive accumulation of tracer within the gallbladder fossa region. Now, post cholecystectomy patients should not have any activity within the gallbladder area. Sometimes you would also see activity accumulating up underneath the diaphragm along the dome of the liver. This is a correlative CT study where a patient complained of abdominal pain five days ap after laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Here, the CT, you can see the cholecystectomy clips in the gallbladder fossa region with free fluid in the gallbladder fossa and free fluid around the liver and spleen, compatible with biliary leak. We're moving on to pediatrics hepatobiliary studies. Usually, these are done in jaundice neonate to differentiate between biliary atresia versus neonatal hepatitis. So in this case, you see radio trace activity in the 
level with progression into the small bowel. So this is a neonatal hepatitis. When you see liver activity and bowel activity, that means activity has progressed from the liver into the biliary ducts and into the small bowel. So that cannot be biliary atresia. That's more commonly associated with neonatal hepatitis. So liver activity plus bowel activity, that's neonatal hepatitis. Biliary atresia, liver activity without bowel activity. So this example is an example of biliary atresia where there's initial imaging shows significant activity in the liver, but no activity in the bowel. 24 hour imaging again shows significant liver activity, but no, and also some activity in the um, urinary bladder, but no activity in the small bowel. So this is biliary atresia. Successful surgical treatment of biliary atresia with Kasai procedure in the first two months of life may help this baby. Now, Technician 99M either analogs are more diagnostic when they're primed, when the liver is primed with five to seven days of phenobarbital, which, which stimulates better hepatic excretion. Moving on to liver spleen imaging. So usually the liver and spleen are better characterized anatomically using CT and ultrasound, but there are some indications using sulfur colloid liver, Im liver spleen imaging. So these include focal nodular hyperplasia, splenomegaly, splenosis, hepatic parenchymal disease, colloid shift. So the images here show a normal liver spleen study. Usually this study takes advantage of the RES system where the sulfur colloid is taken up by cells, for example, in the liver, by cuffer cells of the liver. So that's the reason why you see a lot of activity in the liver, followed by the spleen, then a little bit in the bone marrow. So differential diagnosis of focal hepatic lesions with Technetium 99M sulfur colloid scans. So when we evaluate hepatic lesions, we compare the uptake with respect to the normal liver parenchyma. So the lesion can either have relative decrease uptake of the sulfur colloid compared to the liver parenchyma or increased uptake compared to the liver parenchyma. So some of the conditions with decreased uptake or relative photopenic activity includes hepatoma, metastatic lesions, especially from colon cancer, cysts, hematoma, hemangioma, and abscess. Lesions with relative increased uptake compared to the liver parenchyma includes focal nodular hyperplasia, regenerating nodules, especially with cirrhosis. So here, the top image top images um, show relative decreased uptake of soft colloid in the liver lesion seen here on CT. So this is a case of hepatoma with relative decreased uptake of soft colloid in the lesion. The bottom image, bottom images show a focal area of increased uptake of sulfur colloid compared to the normal liver parenchyma. And this continued to persist even as tracer activity clear from the liver parenchyma. So this is a focal nodular hyperplasia. Additional liver spleen imaging study to evaluate hepatic parenchymal disease. So the top images here shows hemochromatosis, and the bottom image here shows liver cirrhosis. So with these top, image, top images, it shows small right hepatic lobe with a hypertrophy left hepatic lobe and relative decrease radio tracer activity or intensity in the liver parenchyma compared to the spleen. 
So that's a shift of radio trace activity from the liver parenchyma with respect to the spleen. So in the bottom example, you see a with cirrhosis, you see small liver parenchyma with relatively reduced sulfocolloid activity or uptake in the liver parenchyma with intense activity in the spleen and enlarged spleen. There is also relative increase in radio tracer activity in the marrow. So this is a sulfocolloid, a colloid shift. And also sometimes you can tell that there is ascites as you see for relative photopenium surrounding the liver parenchyma in patients with cirrhosis having ascites. So in this example, with sulfocolloid imaging, there is a focal photopenic defect in the right hepatic lobe. There are a number of conditions with relative focal photopenia defect. With this case, there is an additional study with labeled technetium 99M red blood cell, where there is focal uptake of labeled red blood cell in that lesion. Here on the SPECT CT imaging, showing a hypodense lesion in the right hepatic lobe, taking up labeled red blood cell compatible with a hepatic hemangioma. Correlative imaging with ultrasound and CT provided here. So this is an ultrasound showing a focal lesion with hypoechogenic characteristic compared to the normal liver parenchyma. So hepatic hemangioma is hyper, H-Y-P-E-R, in ultrasound. With CT, when CT is used to evaluate hemangioma, it's a multi-phase CT with unenhanced arterial, portovenous, and delayed phases. So in the unenhanced image, the lesion is relative, relatively hypodense or hypoattenuating. In the arterial phase, there is peripheral interrupted nodular enhancement. Portovenous phase shows progressive peripheral nodular enhancement. In delayed phase, there's relative iso isoattenuation relative to the liver parenchyma. So this suggests persistent contrast in the lesion. So this would be characteristics of a hepatic hemangioma with ultrasound and CT, multi-phase CT, and sulfocolloid with technetium 99M red blood cell. Next study with the spleen. So spleen, you can see it taking up sulfocolloid, labeled sulfocolloid, as well as with tag heat damage, tag red blood cell. Usually to evaluate for splenosis, usually um, there is a history of trauma. CT or some imaging modality showing soft tissue density in the left upper abdominal quadrant that has differential of either a mass or splenic parenchyma or multiple ill-defined soft tissues that could be splenic tissues in splenosis. So with these, we usually do a heat damage technetium 99M red blood cell, which showed radio tracer uptake in scattered areas in the left upper quadrant and also lower left chest. SPECT imaging shows radio tracer activity in the soft tissue masses in the left upper abdominal quadrant as well as within the abdominal wall. So especially in patients with history of trauma, this would be most compatible with splenosis. So these are my references. I hope this lecture has been helpful in your studies with um, understanding hepatobiliary studies as well as liver and spleen imaging. Thank you.